North Carolina has always had a rich musical heritage, and we're proud to be a part of such a great treasure. Join Brooke and I as we talk to some of our favorite musicians, some good friends from our home state of North Carolina. Hear their story and see how bluegrass music has shaped their lives and their career. All right, folks, welcome to another edition here of the Carolina Sessions with Darren and Brooke. And this week we've got our special guest and good friend, Jason Burleson. How are you doing, Jason? Doing just fine this morning. How are you guys doing? We're good. We're good. <laughs> I know we've been talking on Zoom here in the last couple months with all everything that's been going on in the world. And we decided to start doing this and talking to a lot of our friends and folks we've picked down through the years and looked up to. and. You're in that category for sure, Jason. I've known you probably over 20-some years, I guess. Yeah, I'm trying to remember when the first time uh, we got to pick any or be around each other. Probably when he was working over at Quick this time. And I believe so, yeah. That would have been 96 or 97. Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah, I know you're from our neck of the woods and definitely Brooks' neck of the woods yeah. up there in, in Avery, Avery County. County. Yeah, just, just over the hill. If That's you right. Take a profile, you just fly right over Buck Hill and you're in some creek. That's right. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about growing up in Avery County and, and the music scene, you know, that was around there. I know um, a lot of great pickers come from there, and then there's a lot of great pickers that didn't go on to do a lot in their music, but definitely, um, you know, it's kind of like a hidden treasure, I think. So. Yeah, well, I remember, you know, when I first got started playing, um, my dad, lost his hearing when I was just really small, but he was a big flat and scrubs fan before that. So um, he couldn't hear a sound, but for some reason he got it in his head when I was about 11 and he wanted me to learn how to play the banjo. So, I, you know, and I really didn't know what it was, but it sounded like it'd be fun. <laughs> so he bought me a cheap banjo and a cousin of mine, Jeter Griffith, he plays and he got me started, you know, with some rolls and showed me some, some basic things. and. Uh, but yeah, I remember just growing up and going up to Jim Jr.'s music bar a lot and seeing seeing a bunch of people up there and uh, played some with Herb Green and Herman Coffey and those guys back when I hadn't been playing, but maybe a year or so. And uh, Jim and Jeannie would have festivals and they, they had, uh, I remember the, the original Dole Austin and Quicksilver was up there one year. So this that would probably been like the 81 or 82. And I got to see them and just, uh, just there was a big music scene around Avery County back at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was a good place to be, definitely. <laughs> yeah, Jim and Jenny's was special. I, I didn't start going, um, you and I met later on in life. I mean, I always heard about you, but um, I didn't start going to Jim and Jenny's until you were already touring professionally. So we never really got yeah. to cross paths until later in our lives. But um, yeah, but I always remember hearing people rant and rave over you and um, just how amazing you were. So I got to, I got to see it with my own eyes at some point. So. <laughs> I remember going up there clogging when they'd have the, the festivals. Of course, my mom and dad was from Cross Nor and Elk Park, but uh, never did play music up there. I don't guess until I was at Tweetsie and it seems like me and Charlie and Alan went over there and played one night at a little fillers convention they had up there and maybe Perry Woody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Later on, I, I played in a band with, with Perry Woody called Midnight Flyer. It was yeah. me and Perry and uh, Mike Street that played with the Bass Mountain Boys. And uh, this guy, Chris Coon, from down around uh, Guilty, North Carolina. Uh -huh. we, had a, we had a little band and we hit all the fiddles conventions. And, you know, just, and I was playing guitar back then, trying to, trying to be Tony Rice the best I could. <laughs> I remember uh, me and Clay Jones would duke it out at all these fiddles conventions to see. See who can win the first place guitar. <laughs> and now, you always, uh, I always considered your your group of friends and pals that you grew up with there was a very good, I'd say, class of musicians all across the state of North Carolina. I come a lot behind y'all. I didn't get to grow up with in and pick during that time and learning, but I mean the folks that you kind of grew up with with Clay and Wayne and Greg Luck and you know, Corbett and just a bunch, Gina Britt. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of you at that, that time, wasn't they? Yeah, all, all of those you mentioned. And then, you know, Alan Purdue was in there and uh, yeah. a bunch of guys like that. And we'd all go to Doyle Festival every year at Denton, you know, and 
we'd go watch the bluegrass album band and then go to the parking lot and pick all night. You know, so yeah. it, was, it was just a wonderful time back then. I'd say uh, the Denton Festival, and you can talk about some other ones, but that made a huge impact to the to the Carolina sound and everything with the musicians around. Don't you agree? Absolutely, yeah. The first time uh, I went to Denton, my uncle lived in Grant Falls, and uh, he had a little old Ford Ranger, and me and a, a buddy of mine, Al Johnson, which you just mentioned, we crawled in the back of that Ford Ranger in Grant Falls in, in the middle of summer and rode to Denton, and it was probably about 150 in, in that thing. He had a camper top on the back. <laughs> wow. And we finally got to Denton, and we parked up on the hill up there, you know, where the, the grounds are laid out. And I remember walking down the stage, and Hot Rise was on stage doing, uh, working on a building, and Tim O'Brien was singing and playing at the same time. Boy, it just sent cold chills all over me. Oh, it, man, yeah. It's 150 degrees, but it froze me to death. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. Um, what other festivals or different venues in the area did you think made an impact on your career in playing? Well, um, another place we used to play with Midnight Flyer was a place called Mental Springs Music Bar, and you've probably, probably been there a few times. And, Down in uh, Waxhaw, North Carolina, I guess it was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. But we didn't we didn't get out and play too much. We went to, and played uh, the Texarkana Music Festival down there for Sam Strange back when the Midnight Fire was still together. I mean, we went down that. And then we went and played this festival in Hoboken, Georgia. It's where the first time I saw uh, Tim Stafford and uh, Adam and Steffi and Barry Bells and those guys was down there. They they had a band called The Boys in the Band. And this was before Dusty Miller formed. So that's the first time I got to hang, hang out with Tim and Adam and all those guys. So that was some good time. Pretty close friends with them guys for for a good while, long before y'all started Blue Highway, right? Yeah, that's that's the first time I met Tim, and then uh, uh, me and Adam, you know, he he lived over in Kingsport, so he'd have jams about every weekend at his grandpa's place up on the river up there. So I'd go over, and we'd just hang out and pick, and you know, I I'd go over to his house just about a weekend, and just just hang out. So I I knew Adam from that and Barry Bales. And um, whenever Tim had left Allison and he was getting the itch to kick again, so he he remembered me from, because when they had Dusty Miller together before they went with Allison, they had a, a banjo player, Brown Fesser, who lived in Nashville. And so all of them lived right around East Tennessee here in Kingsport. And so if they had a little local thing, they called me to come play the banjo so Brian didn't have to drive all the way from Nashville, you know, just like if it was a little Sunday get together, whatever it was. Right. So Tim knew me from that. And so whenever uh Blue Highway was forming, he called and asked if I'd be interested. And of course I was, so that's how that all kind of happened. And that was what, ninety three? We started the uh, we started practicing in late ninety four. I'm thinking like September maybe it was the first time we got together. Yeah. And our first show was uh, New Year's Eve, nineteen ninety four. And then no, we went to school. We, no, we played uh, at this place in a little church in Kingsport for uh, it was called First Night. They had it, you know, the first night of the year. Okay. And we had we did that, and then we played the Down Home in January. And then uh, we went in the studio and and recorded It's Long Long Road in. February or March. So we'd only played two shows when we cut that first record. Wow. <clears throat> Everybody's kind of feeling each other out and, you know, it's just kind of get in there and see what happens. And and luckily enough, you know, it, it won album of the year and a bunch of stuff and really just kind of kick started us. You oh. know, the the promoters wanted to book us and stuff. <clears throat> that, that really helped us to, to get that record out. Well, it was a, a great record and one of my favorite bands of all time. I've been fortunate enough to get to sit in and fill in with y'all occasionally. Yes, sir. It's a huge dream dream of mine. I was a big fan for a long time. But, man, we're fortunate to have uh, those records and have y'all still playing after, what, 25 years now? Yeah. Yeah, it's going on 25 years. We're still at it. And uh, it's it's kind of amazing when you think about it for, for us four to still be 
the edge. You know, and Rob lasted Hill and Hill like for the last four or five years. He's like, yeah. Know, but he just wanted to do things on a smaller scale. You know, like he, he's got this Red Oak kind of thing he does. And then him and Trey have this, Trey Hensley have this duo thing. So he just wanted to do stuff where it wasn't so, so many people, you know, involved in it. With, yeah. And, you know, he's, he's, will always be my brother. He's, they don't come any better than that guy right there. Yeah, they sure don't. He's amazing. Yeah. Back to that first record, uh, where did y'all re record It's a Long, Long Road at? We done that at uh, Rich Adler's studio in Nashville, and that's where um, Allison and, and those guys cut every time you say goodbye. And uh, Rich Adler, he he'd recorded some of uh, Bale Freck and Jerry Douglas's early records on Rounder. He just had a studio in his apartment above his garage. So it's just one room and uh, you know, we we had a really small budget, and we we recorded all the tracks I think in in two days, maybe maybe three days. And then the other thing that was weird about that record is that the first day Rob got sick, so he wasn't even there for the tracking. Um, and I, I don't think he was there at all for the tracking. So he went back later and put his dobro on everything. And a lot of it turned out weird because where he thought I was going to play fields, he ended up playing fields. And where I thought, you know, so where, where I'm laying out and trying to not get in his way, it's just me. <laughs> so it, it, it sounded like I'm not doing anything, but I thought that's where he was going to play. So, and then when he came back in, I wasn't there. So he ended up playing fields where I thought I was going to be playing fields. So that, and that, you know, that's just the way it goes, but it turned out all right. But, Oh, that's great. I, I wish we could all been there together, you know, and then we could have known when when somebody's going to do do whatever. But yeah, I always wish that you know. It, but he got sick. We I think we went down one day to practice, and he got sick that night. And he, you know, he he didn't even get to go to any of the sessions when we kept the track. So wow. But we had a really small budget. I think we did the whole thing. The whole budget was thirty five hundred dollars. I think. And, uh, you know, we just got in there and, and cut, cut it once or twice and we had to go with it, you know. Yeah. Well, it, go back and mess with it forever. So. It sounds great. And Blue Highway's always been known for choosing great material and songs through all the records. And y'all you know, write a lot of material, do a lot of original instrumentals, and it was really good. But I was talking to, to Balcom yesterday and we was talking about the recordings during the the late 80s and early 90s, which that falls into that place. And I don't think that music today is ever it really captured that same sound. I know it's easier to record with digital and all that stuff, but during that time with the tape and the way things was recorded, and I guess just like you're saying, you had to be real tight to go in and do it and lay it down. It just sounded so much better, all those recordings during that time. Would you agree with that or? What's your thought? I do agree with that. And I mean, if you listen to our our first Blue Holly record, there's mistakes on it and there's you can hear punches on it. Like it, I'm I know that after my banjo break on Blue Ridge Mountain Girl, there's just a big old you can just hear a punch right at the end of it. <laughs> and back then, uh it was recorded on tape. And I remember Rich Eller had to put a piece of scotch tape on the tape and roll it back to the right place to get it to to sync up or whatever he's doing. But yeah. he had to basically put a piece of tape on the tape on the machine. Yeah. It was just a whole different way of doing it. And you had to, you know, you just had to go with whatever you got after a couple of takes. Right. You know? And if you're like me, they always pick the one that you hate the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't like this one and everybody else likes the other one every time. That's just the way it happens. Uh, yeah. I, I do agree with Bob. Yeah. It, Everything had a different, different feel and a different sound back then, and I, I think it, it, you know, better than most of the stuff that comes out today. Absolutely, it's it's never been duplicated during that time. I mean, those records of y'all's, you know, the River Band records, uh, you know, the Quicksilver records. It was, you know, a little bit before that, but Allison's yeah. those couple records, man. I mean, it's just like, it's so tight and glued together, and it's just a really awesome sound. But I agree, a hundred percent. And you know the weird thing for us is we hadn't, we probably played together three or four times when we kept that first Blue Holly record. So and 
and nobody really knew the songs were counting them and it just you know it just uh, it also makes you be on your toes more because you know you're not going to be able to go back in a month and fix this little part or do that little part over so you gotta, you gotta really be with it right well you had a, a really good you know addition and touch to that band i know you took a little time off when your son was born and uh, that's when we started picking a little bit more together because you'd come over and started working with us at tweetsie with your brother Charlie and then Big Al Johnson we mentioned and I was working there at that time and you'd yeah. played Tweetsie before uh, and Dollywood is that right? Yeah um, I went over to Tweetsie I guess it was in 93 first time and I just went over there to, to back up Alan Johnson because he wanted to go to try out and after we got over there and played some you know they they wanted me to play too so I was like yeah well why not so we done that and then uh the next year we went down to Dollywood and, and tried out and the same thing, you know, I just went in there to, to back him up for his tryout. And then we got through about the first song and uh, the, the talent manager, his guy named Mike Talent, believe it or not. <laughs> for that. But um, he kind of stopped us right through like the first or second team we were playing is like yeah we want both of you guys and we want to keep you together in the same show because you play so well together and so I was like well I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and do this too even though I didn't I wasn't planning on even doing it so yeah that kind of happened that way and then uh, after, that was in 93 I think we played Dollywood together and then um, I moved back in 94 and that's when Blue Highway started for me yeah, and, and uh, I think it was September of '98 is when I left the band and came back in July of 2000. So I've been back 20 years, you know. Yeah, so. and and Tom replaced you at that time on the banjo, which was a an awesome musician, a great banjo player, you know, down through the years. But I always felt, and they cut a good record with Tom. But mm. I missed you being there, and your your style and your 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 timing and roll and everything just made the band for me, and I and I think a lot of people would agree with me on that. I know oh, you're appreciate times too, but uh, he he was a great musician. But uh, you felt like glue in there, man. You make you make the sound. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, Tom, he's just a great guy, you know, and he's one of the best that ever picked it up in my book. And, and I remember he would he would always act like he was embarrassed every time he got around me because he couldn't play just like me, you know, and I'd be like, don't try to play like me, play like you. I, I want to hear you play like you. Don't play my breaks, play your own breaks. Yeah, and he cut it too on that record, man. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, was, it was some great, great banjo playing, uh, Born With A Hammer In My Hand. He he did all that, you know, and just had a really good sound. But it's like mm -hmm. Malcolm was, we was talking to him and, and others yesterday. You always know when it's Earl, when you hear it on the radio or a tape or CD, you know, you, you know, it's Terry when he's playing just after yeah. a few bars and, uh, and you know, it's Jason Burleson on the five when you, after a few bars too. Well, I, that's, that's about the best compliment you can give a musician. I think is, you know, when you recognize it instantly, if it's, so that, you know, that means they kind of got their own voice on the instrument. Right. And you, compliment you can give. <laughs> sure enough. Well, who are, who are some of your influences, though, through through the years that you've really looked up to? Well, um, I, when I first started playing, my dad had a bunch of, of Flat and Scruggs records, you know, just like old wore out, just hop and skip and hiss. And and I really liked, I really liked it, you know, and, and I could play, play songs, you know, pretty early on after I first started. And I liked it. But. I fell in love with it, with it when I got the first bluegrass album down there. You know, you put we just Ron Block just put something on Facebook the other day about that first chance on bluegrass came home. You know, yeah, I get it. That. And that was the first new record I had, or first new record I bought. I just remember putting the the needle down on that and hearing Crow kick that off. You know, it was like I completely fell in love with it. And that was also the first time I ever heard Tony Rice. And the first time I ever heard him take a guitar break. And I distinctly remember thinking it was a mandolin because I had no idea a guitar was even capable of doing that. And then at the end of the break, you know, there's a G run. And I remember thinking, there ain't no way that 
a guitar because a guitar can't, can't do that, you know. So I became absolutely fascinated with Tony Rice and trying to just find somebody that could do a little bit of that to show me how, how it's done, you know. But that, you know, that record, first we got sound band record, um, the first Quicksilver record, and the Boone Creek one way track record, those three are really, really what made me want to play. Yeah. I, you know, I, I got Manzanita and all all the Tony stuff and just became obsessed with it. Yeah. Now, uh, another great venue I've heard you talk about just from traveling with you so much and us being friends for a long time was the down home over there. And you got to hang with Tony a good bit, I guess, there, didn't you? Well, I didn't really get to, to hang with him. I, I met him a, a few times down there, but... Um, the, the the way I got to know Tony was through these Acutron watches. Uh -huh. And um, we played somewhere and he was backstage and I was showing him my Acutron. And uh, he he gave me his number. He's like, yeah, if you ever need to get it worked on, just holler at me. And so I was in the parking lot of Home Depot one day in Johnson City and I get a call on my cell phone. And I look down and it's, it's Tony Rice's cell phone. <laughs> he called me and he just, you know, I, as you, you know, as you keep on running, you know. <laughs> so, but we struck up a friendship through that. And, you know, I would, he would, he never lets anybody pay him for working on a watch. He won't do that. But he's like, if you find a junker, send it to me. You know, you pay me that way. Because yeah. you'll take the parts of a, an anchor drum that's not working. And so I would get, I'd get on eBay and find watches, you know, that weren't working and send them to him for him fixing mine. So we struck up a friendship through that. And uh, I don't think we ever talked about music for two seconds. He just, he's not one to, to want to talk about it, you know. But he's kind of got real reclusive, you know. And, you know, but he's, he's such a good guy and such a jewel of a human being. You know, he would, he'd do anything for anybody. Yeah. And I, I, I just feel so lucky that I got to know him because he's my all-time musical hero like everybody else, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. made a, a big stamp on our music that we love and influenced so many, you know, and changed it. That that group of musicians there that you mentioned, that from the album band and from the Manzanita days and with Sam and Jerry and all those guys, man, they just really took it to the next level for all of us to, to kind of follow and learn from. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for me, uh, it was almost like this, this is my, even though I was younger than those guys, it was like when I heard those guys, it's like, this is my generation. These are the guys I can relate to. Right. And, it, you know, and then later on, I went back and, and had more of appreciation for Monroe and Flag Stokes and Sonny Brothers. Yeah. It was almost like those were the old guys. These are the new guys. These are, these are my guys, you know, right. That kind of thing. Same way. And, and of course, working with, with the gentleman, I got to be around quite a few of the first generation pickers, but I still come just a little late. Some of them had retired or passed on, but you got to see most of all of them, I guess, playing and being there with them, didn't you? I got to see Monroe um, at a festival in Morganton, North Carolina, out there on the fairgrounds, and that would have been probably 82 or 83, somewhere in there. And he had... Uh, I know we had Mark Henry was playing the bass. He, he went on and played the National League Rest Band. And Baker and Wayne Lewis. And I'm I'm not sure who was playing the banjo at that time. It could have been Butch Robbins, but it seems like that. I think Butch had just left the band about that time. So Monroe was there and Jimmy Martin was there. And Don Reno, I got to see Don Reno before he passed away. He was there. But they had it there on the fairgrounds out past the Kmart there in Morgan. Way back here. So I got to see, yeah, I got to see the first generation. So I'm so lucky, you know. And I got to see Tony a bunch of down home and just, you know, sit within five feet of him and just watch that magic come out of him. Mm -hmm. Got to see a lot. Got to see New Grass Revival there, and, you know. People would line up around the building. The doors didn't open till eight, I think, back then. And the show started at nine. People would start lining up at five or six o'clock. Just to get in a good, get a good seat for New Grass Revival. Yeah. So I got to, I got to witness a lot of, a lot of good music back then. 
Did you uh, ever go down to Green Acres and hear any live music as well? Sure did. Back, uh, I saw New Grass Revival down there quite a bunch and saw uh, National Bluegrass Band a few times. I remember the National Bluegrass Band played the Down Home one night with Peter Lorne when they had that record out in about 88 or 89. And then the next night they played Green Acres and I went to both, both shows. What about uh, Carolina do you think was special that that gives everybody, you know, a certain ingredient, you know, to a band? It's like uh, Earl going with Monroe's band, you know, him being from Carolina and so many good ones and good musicians. I know there's a good, you know, circle that reaches into East Tennessee and Kentucky and Virginia and South Carolina and Georgia there that a lot mm -hmm. of the players come from. It seems like North Carolina has something special. Yeah, I'm not sure. I um, I think it's just the the heritage of growing up around around it, you know. Cause I remember we we we'll do workshops, and I'm sure you run into this too. But we'll do workshops out west, or you know, somewhere away from the south, and people will start asking us about how do you sing like that, you know, how do you sing like Sean Lane, singing tenor. Well, unless you're from Southwest Virginia, you're probably not going to sound like Sean Lane. You know, if you're from Bangladesh, you're probably not going to sound like that. That's right. But I think it, you know, it's just the heritage of growing up around people that that hear the music the same way, and their dialect is the same, their accents the same. It's just got a certain sort of sound to it to bluegrass that you just can't manufacture unless you grow up in it. I don't think. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, some folks asked that to Miss Brooke here about her singing and stuff like that, and how can she pronounce those words or have the power yeah. she? <laughs> no answer, really. <laughs> There's not really an answer. Like you know, you're not going to sound like Ralph Stanley if you grow up in Northern California. Yeah. Just, you know, you just don't learn how to speak that way or talk that way, so you're not going to. You, you're just not going to be able to sound authentic. I mean, not the people from California can't play or sing. It's just not. You're not going to sound like you're from Southwest Virginia unless you grow up in Southwest Virginia. Uh, or North Carolina. Yeah. 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 Ross, no. Exactly. <laughs> but <here. laughs> uh. Well, we've had a good time talking with you today. Anything else you want to add about your career or playing? I know you've been and the band Blue Highways won many awards, been up for Grammys, and man, your number one songs, and just the people that y'all been around and played and influenced the younger crowd of folks that I've I've taught myself over the years that come in and say, you know, teach me this lick or this banjo solo that Jason's done, or <laughs> a lot of people has looked up to you just like you've looked up to so many through the years also. Yeah, uh, it's just, we've just been so lucky to be able to, to hold it together this long, you know, and we, we don't have any plans of stopping. But it's just it's just been a blessing, you know, um, just to be able to, to do something to love as much as I love the music, to just be able to make a living at it. Yeah. And and I want to thank you two for, for asking me to come and, and play with you guys when you need somebody because that's you know that's another way that as bluegrass musicians you have to, you know, be able to, to go and play with different people when when you don't have a gig. So I don't want to thank you guys for, for asking me to come and be part of your band whenever you need somebody. We appreciate it. I don't know how many times you've probably played with us. It's been a ton. I've always yeah. to you as a big brother and we've uh, got to play a lot of music together. So thank you for always joining in. Yes, sir. And I'll be happy to anytime you need somebody, if I can do it, I'll be there. <laughs> Well, we've had a good time, a good conversation today. We appreciate you joining us. And, uh, yes, sir. We we'll appreciate you having me. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you on the creek, I guess. All right. We'll see you across the hill. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Thank Jason. You. You're welcome. See y'all later. Bye-bye.